Hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, or good day. Thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to start our virtual workshop, Frontier of Geographic Duality. Let me try to show, uh, try to show, no, it is, I guess it is impossible from this point. Uh, maybe we can start, uh, we, we can ask Juan to stop uh, sharing no, no, for no, just no, a moment. Don't, don't do this, so don't, uh, don't interrupt him. I will just tell to the people that this workshop is an activity within our program, Geography from High Energy Physics to Quantum Information. And today we have a pleasure to have two talks. Juan Modacena and Neta Engelhardt talks. And Juan will speak about the entropy of Hawking radiation and the information paradox. Please, Juan, 25 minutes. 45. Oh, 45 minutes, I'm sorry. 45, sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everybody is doing okay. And so the talk today will be about the entropy of Hawking radiation. Um, we will discuss some recent pro progress on the information, pro black hole information problem, and it will be uh, a review. And the outline of the talk is the following. First, uh, we we'll start reviewing the black hole entropy, why the black hole entropy is equal to the area of the horizon. And then uh, we'll describe, describe a new formula for black hole entropy, the so-called fine-grained gravitational entropy formula. And we'll find that this entropy formula is also given by uh, an area formula, but it's a different area. Um, and then we'll discuss how to compute the entropy of radiation coming out of black holes. And we'll see that one gets a result uh, consistent with information conservation as opposed to information loss. Now, this talk will not be historical, but uh, hopefully will be pedagogical. Um, of course, the black hole, uh, the simplest black hole solution goes back to the beginning of general relativity. Um, and um, um, another important property of black holes is that they have a temperature, uh, which for the previous black hole is given by uh, the famous uh, Hawking formula. Um, now, there is a connection between uh, in quantum mechanics between finite temperatures and circles in Euclidean time that it's useful to think about. Um, so for example, the thermal partition function of a quantum system can be computed by a path in by, well, of course, this is just the usual definition of the thermal partition function, the trace of e to the minus beta h, where we summarize all the states in the Hilbert space. And this is also equal to evolution in Euclidean time on a circle of length beta. So the fact that it has length beta has to do with uh, what appears in front of the Hamiltonian. The fact it's Euclidean is because there is no I there, and um, that it's a circle is because we have a trace. And so a theory in Euclidean circle is related to a system in thermal equilibrium, and the temperature is, of course, uh, one over the length of the Euclidean circle. Um, now, with this in mind, we can uh, look at the same geometry we had before. So this was the Lorentzian uh, black hole geometry. And we can uh, go to Euclidean space. So if we take the time and we make it uh, Euclidean, we find uh, an interesting geometry. So this is a completely a geometry with, uh, without the time direction, all, all our space directions. Um, and here is the circle. This is the Euclidean time direction. And so far away, it's a circle of, well, we, we will take it to be a circle far away. And if we take it to be a circle of an appropriate radius, uh, then we find that the geometry is completely smooth uh, at the point where, which was the horizon in Lorentzian signature. So this point R equal to Rs, which uh, in Lo the Lorentzian signature was when the metric was shrinking to zero, the redshift factor. Uh, now in Euclidean space, it also continues to shrink to zero. Um, but if we choose the radius of the circle appropriately, uh, it shrinks to zero in the same way that the circle around the origin of Euclidean space shrinks to zero, so it's the purely coordinate singularity. So it's a completely smooth geometry. Um, that's as long as we take uh, the radius of the circle to be given by uh, 2 pi rs, um, and that's precisely also the, the, the formula for the Hawking temperature. So the temperature of, um, so we can interpret, so this is perhaps the simplest way to derive the 
the, the Hawking temperature formula, which has to um, do this, and then far away, uh, the, the circle will have this size, and that's the temperature we'll see far away from the black hole. Of course, if we are at some radial position closer to the horizon, uh, the circle is smaller, and an observer that sits at the fixed radial position there will see a higher temperature. Um, now, uh, this formula for the temperature um, allows us to define an entropy using the uh, first law of thermodynamics. So we, we know the energy, which is just the mass, and we know the temperature is a function of the mass, so we can integrate this formula to find uh, this uh, formula for the entropy, which uh, turns out to say that the entropy is equal to the area of the black hole horizon. So that's the area of the surface at the tip of this, uh, of this geometry we had here. So the geometry um, in the radial and Euclidean time direction has the geometry of a cigar, so it has constant size far away, and it shrinks at the origin. And on each point, uh, on each point on this cigar, we have a two sphere of some radius. So the, the radius of the two sphere goes to infinity as we uh, go to infinity, and is, it goes to some constant uh, equal to the area of the horizon at the horizon. So uh, we get this formula, which uh, gives us uh, the black hole entropy, and is proportional to one over g newton. So in the limit that g newton goes to zero, it goes to infinity. Now, from this, we, we learn that the black hole is a thermodynamic object. And this is, uh, this is surprising. This was surprising when it was first found. And in fact, in the um, Bardeen, Hawking, um, and um, Carter paper, they noticed this, form, this analogy between black holes, the black hole formulas for the first law of thermodynamics. And they explicitly said that this does not mean that we have an actual temperature. And then Hawking a year later uh, came up with the, the idea of the temperature. So it was surprising to, to the people who discovered this. Um, now, of course, we are somewhat used to this. Um, but, um, but well, before we, we discuss in more details uh, some aspects of the entropy, it's useful to review in a little more detail the space-time geometry of a black hole. So this is the space-time geometry of a black hole made from collapse. Uh, these are Penrose diagrams where um, on each point on this diagram, there is a two sphere. So we're going to consider in this talk only spherically symmetric situations. Uh, of course, you could do this without spherical symmetry, but just to do the diagrams, it's easier to do it with spherical symmetry. And um, uh, this is the, so here the, the horizontal direction is roughly space and the vertical direction is uh, roughly time. And the um, 40, 45 degree lines are, trajectories of radially outgoing or radially ingoing uh, light ray. So this is a radially ingoing light ray. And uh, here we are representing the geometry of a star. Uh, here r equal to zero, that's the center of the, the coordinates. So it's, it's this, this line here is, uh, is a perfectly okay line, uh, not, not singular. And we have a star uh, which collapses into a black hole. So the metric outside the star, so in this whole region, uh, that's the Schwarzschild metric. The metric inside the star is different from Schwarzschild uh, because we have matter. So Schwarzschild is a solution of Einstein's equations in the vacuum. In the star, we have different equations. But well, you can find the geometry, and uh, and one finds uh, that the black hole develops a singularity here, where the metric, the curvature, diverges. Okay, and this geometry has the peculiar feature that there is this region called the interior, which cannot send signals to the outside. So if you um, send a signal, that signal will go to the singularity um, and will never reach an observer who's here in this region. So this is this region far away is the infinite future, uh, far away from the, the horizon, far away from the black hole. Okay, so that's a black hole made from collapse. Now notice that uh, the, 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 the horizon is defined to be the last, uh, the, the trajectory of the last ray, light ray that kind of wants to make it to infinity. So the light rays emitted a little bit earlier will uh, go to infinity, a little bit later will uh, get into a singularity. And um, the area of the horizon is increasing. So here it has, in this region here, it has zero area. And then uh, during uh, this part of the evolution, the area grows and it reaches the uh, area of the horizon at this point, and then it stays constant. And of course it increases in this case, but actually there is an area law which uh, says that the horizon area always increases. And this can be interpreted 
uh, using the formula for black hole thermodynamics as uh, related, as we're implying or consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, now, when, when we have a black hole, we might uh, also have some matter outside. And so we define uh, the, it, it's reasonable to define the so-called generalized entropy, which is the area uh, of the black hole uh, plus the matter outside. Of course, Bekenstein's original reasoning was that the entropy was the entropy of matter, and then we had to add this other term, which is the area. Of course, the area is uh, usually the biggest term. It, uh, it's bigger numerically because it uh, has a one over G Newton in front. Um, okay, so that the proper uh, formula for the entropy of the outside system of the black hole is this, uh, this formula here. Now, there is a question, which is that when a black hole emits Hawking radiation, it loses energy. And its area seems to become smaller. And this might be a little puzzling, because we can ask uh, what happens to uh, the entropy. So if the area becomes smaller, it might seem that the entropy becomes smaller. But um, we have to remember that this entropy of matter includes uh, the entropy of quantum fields. So even the fields that are involved in Hawking radiation uh, are contributing to the entropy. And so when the black hole evaporates, uh, these fields uh, gain some entropy, which is bigger than the decrease in the area. So that the second law is obeyed. And one can um, prove that uh, once you put in here the entropy of the quantum field theory, so this is um, the full quantum field theory uh, for Neumann entropy of the region outside the black hole horizon. And once you include this piece, uh, this, uh, this obeys the second law. So now it obeys the second law, even including uh, quantum mechanical uh, features. And this was only proven in, uh, in, 20, in 2020, 2010. Um, okay, so this entropy, this piece of the entropy is divergent as a UV divergence when we take the cutoff to zero, but that uh, UV divergence is uh, absorbed into a renormalization of the Newton constant so that this full uh, formula is uh, UV finite in perturbative quantum field theory. So in the, in the regime where we can trust Einstein's equations, which is when we um, have um, a space time which curvatures, uh, radius of curvatures or length scales much larger than the Planck length, and we choose the cutoff of the quant quantum field theory to be la larger than the Planck scale, the, the length scale larger than the Planck scale. Now this results, uh, of course, are, are fairly old, but they have inspired a, a central hypothesis. And uh, sometimes uh, you can call it a central dogma, similar to the biologist central dogma that information goes from DNA to RNA and so on. So this is a central dogma about the uh, way information is stored in, uh, in space time or some features about information in space time. And so this is uh, the central hypothesis or central dogma for black holes as quantum systems which says that a black hole as seen from the outside can be described as a quantum system with s degrees of freedom or s qubits, where s is the area of the black hole in Planck units. So it's uh, the formula given by the entropy essentially. So, um, and not only that, but uh, also uh, as seen from the outside, it evolves according to unitary evolution. So roughly speaking, what they're saying is that if we have a black hole, um, and we focus, let's say we have some, uh, some we, cut, we consider the region including the black hole and whatever is outside the black hole, so this uh, uh, quantum matter that is fluctuating around the black hole, and we take that whole region, that whole region can be uh, replaced by a system of qubits. Um, now, these qubits are not, uh, or this, this Hilbert space, which has finite dimension and so on, is uh, not very manifest in the gravity description. We don't, we don't know how to see it very explicitly in the gravity description. Um, we think it's a property of a consistent theory of quantum gravity. Um, so that's why this is a hypothesis. It's not something that you, we, we learn how to derive from uh, the rules of, of gravity, at least of uh, the gravity theories, uh, general gravity, semi-classical gravity theory. Now, there is some, um, now once uh, we have that, we can interpret uh, this type of calculation uh, as, um, given, so this trace over Hilbert space would be the trace of those mysterious uh, qubits of the Hilbert space. And the right-hand side here is a gravity computation, where, which we do with gravity, and then 
We could even multiply by the partition function of quantum fields in this geometry and so on. Now, something important here that we should keep in mind is that this uh, formula here, which is very concrete and where, which we can compute very precisely, uh, order by order in the G-Newton expansion, tells us the answer, but it does not tell us what microstates we're counting. It does not give us an explicit uh, description of the microstates. So the left-hand side here, so this piece, is uh, somewhat mysterious. And um, so, okay. Now, what's the evidence that this is correct? So we have evidence from very concrete theories of quantum gravity, like uh, string theories and using deep brains and so on. So the black hole entropy formula, starting with the work of Strominger and Buffa, gives us uh, some, some evidence that this is correct, um, and which reproduces the area formula. Then we have uh, ADS-CFT or holography, which tells us that we, we have a black hole inside, inside ADS. In this case, we can replace this whole region by a very concrete quantum field theory in the boundary, and there we have a, an explicit description of these degrees of freedom. Um, but we have a kind of mysterious relationship between those degrees of freedom and the actual geometric description. Um, okay, so that's uh, some evidence, but um, there was, uh, in 1976, Hawking said that this cannot be true. So he, he had some argument that this picture uh, could not be correct. Um, and what he said was he considered this geometry of a black hole uh, made from collapse, but now accounting for the effects of evaporation. So the idea is that when we have the geometry made from collapse, we have a, a piece of a portion of the geometry which is similar to what we had before for the collapsing black hole. But now we have Hawking radiation, and uh, so we have the Hawking radiation that uh, goes away, so it's made out of pairs. So one is uh, a mode that goes away, and another is a mode that goes into, uh, into the black hole. And these pairs are entangled, and as long as we consider the full surface, uh, we have a pure state. But once the black hole evaporates completely and we have in the future region, just uh, in this region, we have the geometry essentially of Minkowski space um, with some radiation. And when we consider just this region, so just the outside, uh, remember that this uh, central hypothesis is a, is a statement about what happens outside. When we have this description outside, we are forgetting about the interior. And so the entanglement that we had uh, between the radiation modes and the, its their partners that are inside the black hole would give rise to a non-zero uh, entropy here outside. Okay, and so um, he he said, well, uh, imagine you form a black hole from a pure state, and then as a function of time, you will see that the entropy. So here we are computing the entropy of the outgoing radiation. We'll see that the entropy follows this green curve of that rises and then uh, and then stabilizes. So this is after the black hole evaporated completely. Uh, of course, it's not it's not linear. It just just should uh, take this picture that it essentially rises. Um, and on the other hand, the the entropy, the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, which is given by the error of the horizon, uh, steadily decreases until it uh, goes all the way to zero when the black hole evaporates completely. Now, this initial increase is is not really a problem because uh, it could be that uh, it could be that the black hole um, the, the the entropy increases. Uh, but it increases because it's entangled with some other of these mysterious black hole degrees of freedom. So as long as the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole is bigger than the entropy of the radiation, we have no problem at least in principle with the central hypothesis. But once we are here, where the entropy of radiation is bigger than the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, then we have a problem. Because if we are going to claim that we have this whole system in a pure state, uh, it cannot be that this is entangled with something that has less degrees of freedom. So the dimensional Hilbert space is given by this, uh, by this value, which is less, and so it cannot, uh, it cannot work. So then, um, therefore, um, Don Page said that the, the true entropy of the radiation should follow this other um, purple curve. So it should start going down when the entropy of the black hole goes down. And one question was whether there is any way of computing uh, this entropy. Now, of course, if you had a full microscopic description like ADS, CFT, and so on, then you, you would be able to compute it. But the question is, how do we get this uh, computation from sort of gravity formulas? Um, now I should say that there were other apparent paradoxes with the black hole entropy formula. And I, I'll, I'll discuss some of them because they, it's a useful uh, way to, to think about this. 
Um, so one other uh, funny formula, um, a funny geometry, is the geometry of the full uh, Schwarzschild solution. So this is the solution where you take the, the original metric that was describing this uh, exterior region, and then you analytically continue it everywhere, and then you find that the actual geometry describes two exterior regions, the, the, the original one we had and a second one, which is essentially identical. And these two exterior regions are sharing a common interior, so both a future and past interior. And this is a vacuum solution with no matter um, and solution of Einstein's equations. Um, and now um, you can ask, uh, well, so that's a funny feature. So what, what entropy are we computing in this case? Um, we, the, the whole state here along this surface uh, is a pure state. So it's, it's a little unclear what entropy we're computing. Um, so that's one question. So another question is, there are other geometries which we can build out of uh, this one here. So we can replace the right exterior, not by a uh, flat space, but let's say a closed universe. Um, and then what we have is uh, a geometry with whose spatial slice contains, uh, well, a flat space region far away. And then we have this big closed universe. And here uh, we have a region which looks uh, very similar to the black hole solution we discussed with two asymptotic regions. One is the flat space region and the other is this uh, closed universe region. And so now uh, we can ask, uh, well, let's say we describe the system here from the outside, from this region. From this region, there is this hole, uh, which looks like it's behind the horizon, this region. Uh, th this region here in the bottom, this uh, closed universe is behind the horizon. And the question is whether we should include the entropy of whatever is here. We could have a very big closed universe with galaxies and lots of entropy, which is bigger than the area of the horizon. And if uh, the entropy inside, so the S inside, is bigger than the area of the horizon, then it looks like we have a kind of paradox, apparently. Or at least, we definitely, this is a configuration which is a counterexample to the idea or the statement that the area entropy, this formula for the entropy, counts the entropy in some sense inside the black hole. By inside, I mean the region that is spatially, uh, well, which on a spatial slice is behind the horizon. Now we'll see now how to resolve this, uh, this, these confusions and resolving these confusions will help us uh, understand also the black hole case. Now this, all these confusions involve the black hole interior and also they in involve computations of the fine grain entropy, not the thermodynamic entropy. I'll try to explain better what the relationship is between the two. And, and, and these confusions also involve the notion of entanglement. Now first we have to go back to basics and um, in the central hypothesis, this is state, the statement again of the central hypothesis. And here, um, it's important that this is telling us that um, we have a quantum system that describes the black hole as seen from the outside. I mean, that's what we are talking about here. Um, and so it's not, no statement has been made about uh, the inside yet. It's only a statement for the time being about the black hole as seen from the outside. Now, so now let's go uh, first to back to this uh, two-sided Schwarzschild solution. So now uh, we have two outsides. Um, so we could imagine these two are in uh, basically the same geometry, but very far away from each other. So this is again a geometry very closely related to the one we discussed before. Um, so here the two interiors are connected as they are connected in the Schwarzschild, the maximal extended Schwarzschild solution. And so in this case, we can apply the central hypothesis independently for this black hole and from the, for the other black hole. And so this black hole is described by a quantum system and the other black hole is described by, by another quantum system. And the idea is that uh, this connected geometry arises when these two quantum systems are in a particular entangled state where we um, consider all the energy eigenstates of one black hole, the energy eigenstates of the other black hole, and we sum them over with, we entangle them with this uh, particular this thermal looking factor. Um, and if they are in this particular state, the idea is that the geometry will be described by the Schwarzschild geometry. And we think that whenever there is some, some entanglement uh, between the two systems, or so large, well, let's say some entanglement, then there is some kind of geometric connection. So for this case, uh, we know what the, the entanglement pattern is and the geometric connection. And 
but we think this is probably a more general uh, feature. And we call this uh, ER equal 3PR, that the einstein rosen bridge, which is this uh, geometric connection between the two, is the same as the einstein podolsky rosen uh, entanglement. Um, okay. And we can uh, view this particular, uh, particular state that looks a little weird as uh, the follows. So you take uh, the Euclidean uh, black hole and you imagine evolving over half the circle, half the thermal circle, that's the beta over two factor. And then uh, from then on, you go to Lorentzian evolution. So you view this as the preparation of a state. Uh, when you cut at these points, uh, you have two copies of the quantum system. But in the geometry, we have one spatial slice, which is this blue slice of the einstein rosen bridge. And that's this uh, blue slice here in the geometry. And then from then on, we can join it to the Lorentzian uh, black hole. And this is one way to justify that, that statement. Now, the rest of the paradox is involved understanding better the notion of fine grain entropy. So let's um, discuss. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, in this case, the black hole entropy uh, is the entanglement entropy of one black hole with the second black hole. So if we take the two black holes together, we have a pure state. If we take only one of them, we have an entanglement entropy equal to the black hole entropy. So the rest of the paradox is involved in understanding fine grain entropy. So let's uh, discuss that. So um, we can think of, uh, so coarse grain entropy is an entropy that arises because we are measuring only a subset of the observables of Hilbert space. You can say that it arises from sloppiness. So the state might be underlyingly pure, but if we only measure a few state, a few observables, it might look like uh, it has some entropy. Uh, for example, we could have a gas uh, in a room that starts from a, little, a corner in the room, so it would have relatively low entropy. If you let it evolve, it will fill the whole room and it will be essentially indistinguishable from one that uh, is in a completely random state. Um, on the other hand, we have the notion of fine grain entropy or von Neumann entropy, which is if you have the density of states, the, the density matrix that describes the state, you calculate trace rho log rho, and that tells us the irreducible fine grain entropy. So here you can measure uh, all the observables you want about the system, but you'll have uh, this entropy uh, in the end. I mean, this is some, what, what you somehow ignore about the system. Okay, so um, the, the area formula for, for, well, first of all, this, uh, this first entropy obeys the second of thermodynamic. It, it increases, uh, it can increase under uh, evolution, while this one here is conserved under unitary evolution. Okay. Now, the, the formula of entropy uh, due to, um, the formula for the black hole entropy should be a coarse grain entropy because it increases under time evolution. So we can ask, uh, how do we compute this kind of entropy, okay? Now, for the moment, we'll be talking about the entropy of the black hole as seen from the outside, okay? So that's the entropy of this quantum system that appear in the central hypothesis, okay? So it's some, that mysterious Hilbert space whose entropy we're computing using gravitational methods, okay? And as we said, yeah, the other, well, this is just the same question. Now, the idea is that the fine grain uh, gravitational entropy uh, is computed by a formula which uh, is again uh, based on is similar looking so it looks similar to the black hole formula so there is an area term and then there is the matter term of the some region outside but the area is a is, is different it's not the area of the horizon but it's any area that surrounds the black hole and you just extremize uh, you, you roughly speaking minimize uh, over uh, you find the minimum of all possible areas um, there is a sense we have the extremum here because in the time direction it's not quite the minimum, but let me ignore that for the time being, for the sake of time. So conceptually what we are doing is minimizing this area or this generalized entropy, and we are allowed to take this area inside the horizon. So we start from, let's say, some area here which surrounds the black hole, and then we can make it smaller and maybe take it even inside the black hole. Um, and um, in principle, we can shrink it as much as we want as long as we minimize this quantity. Okay? And again, this is always the entropy of the, of the quantum system that describes the black hole from, as seen from the outside. This is the, the, the quantum system that the central hypothesis talks about. So let me show you just uh, maybe this, this definition might have been a little confusing. So let's just see some examples for how to see how this works. So let's discuss, for example, uh, black hole as formed from collapse. So 
this uh, violet surface is uh, the uh, so we had the black hole and then we had we are considering the entropy of some region which is within some surface of some radius capital r very large much bigger than this and this is this uh, surface here okay the purple surface so we start from the purple surface and we take an area and we shrink it and we compute the entropy from we take the area plus whatever is outside the area and we when we shrink it in this case we can shrink it all the way to the center and we compute the entropy on this surface and the entropy on this surface um, well first of all the area here is zero um, and then the entropy on this surface is equal to the entropy of the star the entropy of the star that formed the black hole um, and so in this case the uh, entropy is the entropy of the matter that makes the star and it's conserved so it's uh, always you get the same the same value okay so as, as we expect for fine grain entropy this is different than the area of the horizon which was increasing okay so the area of the horizon here is increasing so thermodynamic entropy grows but the fine grain entropy remains constant okay so if the entropy of the star was zero then the end the full fine grain entropy would be zero. Um, for the now we can do the same thing, but for this uh, Schwarzschild uh, wormhole. So we take just one side and we compute the entropy on one side here. We again take the surface, but the minimal area surface is here. So the, the along this uh, blue surface, the area of a sphere uh, decreases as we go from infinity to this point. And then from this point onwards, it, can, it starts increasing again. So the minimum or the extremum is really at this point, and that is again the area of the horizon. So in this case, the fine grain entropy is actually equal to the area and equal to the thermodynamic entropy. And there are also intermediate cases where uh, the fine grain entropy is between the, the, the thermodynamic entropy and let's say something very small. Um, now, you should be surprised by the claim that there is a formula for the fine grain entropy, okay? So the, the previous developments on black hole entropy the, that were saying that the, the entropy of black holes was um, given by the area of the horizon have led people to think that maybe geometry is a kind of uh, thermodynamic approximation or hydrodynamic approximation to black holes. Okay. Now, when we are doing dealing with hydrodynamics, we don't have uh, formulas for the fine grain entropy. We have um, we have formulas for the coarse grain entropy, but never for the fine grain entropy. So there's something special about black holes that we can have also a formula about the fine grain entropy. We have a formula for the coarse grain entropy and we, in some sense black holes seen from the outside look like hydrodynamics, but because black holes have interiors, uh, they allow us to compute the fine grain entropy and that's a very, uh, very special feature of uh, Einstein geometry and black holes. Now it's useful to, in, in, to discuss a new, uh, a new concept um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explain why, why we introduce it a little bit later. So we introduce this new concept, which is called entanglement wedge. And what we do is, as we try to minimize the entropy, we keep track of the region swept by the surface as it tries to extremize the fine grain entropy, um, the generalized entropy. So the region outside the quantum extremal surface is called entanglement wedge. So let's just see how this definition works. So we start from some cutoff surface and we start shrinking. So this is the surface that we're shrinking, trying to extremize the surface. And um, so it swept so far this region, it might sweep more as, as it continues to go in. And um, so in this case, for example, it goes from here up all the way to the horizon. Uh, and then we consider the full causal development of this, so all the places whose evolution is determined by, can be determined by initial conditions on this surface. And this whole region of space-time is called the entanglement wedge. It looks a bit like a wedge, so that's why it's called the entanglement wedge. Um, um, so uh, again, this is uh, in the case of a uh, black hole. Notice that the entanglement wedge in this this particular case uh, of the black. So in this previous case, it only contains a region outside the horizon. Is there a question? No. Okay. So, um, in the case of a black hole that from, forms com collapse, we said that the surface that minimizes it's here. So, in this case, the entanglement wedge covers a portion of the black hole interior. Okay, okay so let's go back now to the central hypothesis. And we saw that uh, there was a quantum system that was describing the black hole as seen from the outside. 
And one question is, how much of the space-time does this quantum system describe, okay? Does it describe only the outside, a portion of the inside, all the inside, which portion, et cetera? Okay. So now we'll try to answer this question. So now um, we'll introduce a new hypothesis, and this is the hypothesis of entanglement wedge reconstruction, okay? And it says that the quantum system describes everything that is included in the entanglement wedge. So the quantum system that describes the black hole as seen from, from the outside does not describe only the region outside the horizon. It describes the whole region outside uh, the extremal surface, okay? The, the surface that minimizes, that gives us the fine grain entropy. So it de describes everything that is included in the entanglement wedge. Um, the word describes uh, is explained a bit better here, but I'm running a bit out of time. So describing means that if we have uh, a probe qubit uh, inside whose states we don't know, um, we can recover the, the state of that qubit um, using uh, doing perhaps very complicated operations. So the recovery depends on, uh, on the state, not of the state of the probe, but the state of the whole rest. And uh, it's somewhat similar to, to quantum error correction. And there are many consistency checks that uh, this hypothesis uh, makes sense. But of, of course, it's not something mathematically proven, but uh, it uh, passes many consistency checks. Um, now, um, so the, the, the old discussion of the 70s of black hole entropy um, is saying that if you do simple, simple observations uh, on this quantum system, you see everything that is outside the horizon. Okay, it's similar to a thermodynamic observations. Um, the new idea is that if you do arbitrarily complex observations, then you can see everything that is outside the, this minimal surface, everything in the entanglement wedge. So you can go behind the horizon, but not arbitrarily. You can only go up to the entanglement wedge, up to the, the end of entanglement wedge, up to this uh, extremal surface. Whatever lies beyond uh, is not described by the quantum system that describes the black hole from the outside. Now, we'll argue that this removes some apparent paradoxes. Um, so the first one was this bag of gold uh, paradox of Wheeler. Um, so we can now, the resolution of this paradox depends on entropy because it depends on uh, fine grain entropy. So there are two possible bags of gold we can have. One is um, one where uh, there is uh, little entropy here inside. So in this, in this particular example, um, there is uh, little entropy, small entropy here. And here, there are lots of entropy, lots of entropy inside. The, the two could have the same energy, but they could have different entropies. And if you have little entropy, then when we surround uh, this outside black hole, it, it might be convenient for us to include the whole region inside when we search for the minimal area surface, because the area, so here we have some area of the horizon, but here the area shrinks to zero. And so uh, in that case, the area contribution is zero. And if there is little entropy, there is little contribution from the matter entropy. So if we have little matter entropy, this will be, we will describe the whole inside. On the other hand, if we have a lot of matter entropy, we, um, it's convenient for us to stop uh, here at the horizon. We pay some price, which is the area of the horizon, uh, but we don't include this, area, this entropy, which could be much bigger than the area of the horizon. So this is the case where the entropy inside uh, is bigger than the area. Um, and in this case, uh, the fine grain entropy is here, and the entanglement wedge only goes up to the horizon. Okay. So something important here is that the size of the entanglement wedge depends on the fine grain entropy and not on the energy of the matter fields inside. Okay. So because the definition involves computing a fine grain entropy. Okay. So so this uh, resolves uh, this problem. Uh, this, this old confusion that goes back uh, basically to Wheeler, to the, the first thoughts about black hole entropy. Um, and now uh, we'll apply these this insights to an old evaporating black hole, okay? Now, the first observation is that the geometry of an old evaporating black hole is actually pretty similar to what we discussed about the, the bag of gold. So let's discuss the geometry at let's say some, some spa particular spatial slice and some late time t, um, we, we can take um, a spatial slice which includes the whole black hole interior, 
but does not include the radiation that was emitted earlier. Okay. So in this case, uh, when we consider the um, the geometry, um, you know, uh, well, the, the the region inside this purple surface at this time, uh, we include a lot of entropy of the partners of Hawking radiation. So there will be a lot of entropy in the interior, but because we are doing this at some late time t, uh, the area here. So the area at this point will be less than the entropy inside. Okay, so we are again in a situation similar to the bag of gold example. And okay, um, so we have this old evaporating black hole. The naive uh, one possibility for the entanglement wedge would be to extrapolate the one we had for early times, where we include the whole uh, black hole interior. But in this case, we end up having a contribution from the entropy of the black hole inside. So we get a lot of entropy, okay? And this was what was leading to some problems. Uh, but now, um, the, the crucial observation that was made in these papers, um, one by Pennington and the other by Almeri, Engelhardt, Maros, and Maxfield in, in 2019, uh, they, they found that there is actually a second extremal surface, uh, which is just a little bit behind the horizon. And in this case, um, we, the, the, the entropy is just given by the area of the surface, but uh, that could be smaller, so we mean by the area, but that would be smaller than, uh, could be much more or smaller than the entropy inside, okay? So the, ent so the entropy inside is not included in the entanglement wedge, and this is the correct surface to uh, consider at late times, okay? So, um, there are, there are two implications about this calculation for black holes, is that first, that the fine grain entropy is close to the old, uh, to the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, which is good, right? So this is consistent with the central, central hypothesis. Um, and also that the quantum system uh, that describes the black hole from the outside is describing only a little tiny portion of the interior. So it's not describing this whole interior region here now, but uh, it's only inc including this region of the interior. Okay. Um, so the fine grain entropy of the black hole, uh, again, this is the fine grain entropy of the quantum system describing the black hole as seen from the outside, uh, goes up and then goes down uh, once we have the second extremal surface. So this, this line that goes this way is what we would get from the trivial extremal surface, the one that goes all the way to r equal to zero. And this other line here is what we get from the new uh, extremal surface. Um, now we can also discuss the entropy of the radiation. Um, now the radiation uh, appears to be in a mixed state, and but why does it appear to be in a mixed state? It's because it was entangled uh, with the fields that were inside the black hole. And how do we know this, okay? We know this through the evolution of gravity. And even though uh, the radiation, you can store it in a quantum computer in a system where you can neglect gravity, you cannot neglect gravity uh, you cannot forget that you use gravity to get that state, okay? So you, 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 you got gravity to get that state. Um, and so we should use the rules of gravity to compute the fine grain entropy of that state, that state. And so if we, if we want to compute the naive entropy of the radiation, we would say, well, we just compute the entropy of everything that is here. Um, and, and that would be, that, that's what, what Hawking did, okay? So this is, this is what Hawking did. But now uh, we, are, we are told that we can use the rules of gravity and the rules of gravity allow us to uh, put some extra surfaces and so on. So rules of gravity allow us to say that we, when we compute the entropy of the radiation, we can also include here something we can call an island um, or some, it includes a portion of the black hole interior um, up to uh, a certain, point here, and that point is exactly the same quantum extremal surface that was found in the, in the papers I mentioned by Pennington and Almeria et al. Um, and the idea is that now uh, this region will be an entanglement wedge of radiation, okay? So we, we saw already that this region was, uh, did not belong to the quantum system describing the black hole. So this was the, the region described by the quantum system describing the black hole. And the idea is that this portion of the interior is really being described by the radiation. Okay? This is what follows uh, very directly from uh, these formulas for computing the entanglement entropy. 
in, in systems that contain gravity. So we have this, there is this new rule that includes uh, including these islands and so on. Now you might say, well, this is just an accounting trick, okay? So you, you haven't really done anything, you just accounted differently. But this accounting rule is the accounting rule that gravity instruct, instructs us to use, okay? And also the accounting rule was derived before it was applied to this problem. It's not that we made up this rule or people, uh, these other authors made up this rule for this problem. It, it's just simply that it was uh, the rule that was derived before, it was applied to this problem, and it gives us a, a reasonable or consistent answer for this problem. Of course, we, we should understand better this accounting rule and why gravity is using this accounting rule. And one can derive, uh, I, I run out of time, but I, one can, uh, let me just mention that one can derive this gravitational fine grain entropy formula using a logic which is similar to the Gibbons Hawking, uh, sim similar to the Gibbons Hawking uh, Euclidean black hole argument. So the same um, formula that uses Euclidean geometry and so on can be used to uh, derive uh, this, this formula. Now, I should emphasize that this derivation does not tell us where the microstates are and so on. It has the same, if you wish, drawbacks as the usual old black hole entropy formulas, uh, but it gives us the answer for the, for the entropy. Of course, uh, if one had a full microscopic theory of gravity, then we would um, get this sort of holographic dual. And one little, well, maybe I won't even mention this. Uh, okay, let me go back to conclusions. So in summary, we reviewed the thermodynamic black hole entropy formula. We described the new fine grain gravitational entropy formula, and we applied it to the computation of the entropy of radiation or, or the entropy of an old black hole. And we saw that we got results uh, consistent with gravity. Now, a, a lot of what we discussed was derived by thinking about aspects of ADS-EFT, which itself was used, was derived using string theory and so on. But for applying these formulas and for everything that I discussed today, uh, you only need to know gravity as an effective field theory to apply these formulas. So just the gravity in the usual effective field theory treatment allows you to uh, derive these formulas, just uh, to, to, to use these formulas. And I, I have to say that it, it's really surprising how clever gravity is. I'm really surprised it can do all this. And of course, we would like to get a more explicit picture of the microstates from the gravity point of view, right? So we have a, an explicit description of the microstates from the holographic point of view and so on. But how do we get that picture from the gravity point of view? And what further lessons is this teaching us about the interior or the black hole singularity? So we didn't need to know anything about the black hole singularity or, um, uh, for, 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 for discussing this but maybe it's secretly also teaching us some lessons about this other question. So there are many questions, of course, that remain, but I wanted to highlight the things that have been learned over the, the past few years. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Juan, well, thank you very much for your great talk. So we left maybe 10 minutes for questions. Please ask questions for Juan. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, thanks for uh, the very nice talk. So in uh, one of uh, the uh, pictures that uh, you had shown, you had uh, shown the uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction. Uh, uh, sorry, not the reconstruction, but uh, the entanglement wedge in an asymptotically uh, flat space time for the short steel black hole. So uh, I was wondering, uh, if, uh, uh, so, okay, let me back up. Uh, so, uh, the calculation of entanglement entropy from gravity has so far uh, been most rigorously realized in uh, asymptotically ADS space-time. So, uh, I was yes, wondering yes, yes. whether you expect uh, some sort of same thing, the uh, 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 faithful uh, fine-grained entropy, even for asymptotically flat space-time as well, where uh, the uh, extremal surface would continue to give the uh, uh, fine-grained entropy in a uh, faithful manner. Yes, yes. So uh, in, in this talk, I was uh, thinking, I, I, I draw these uh, purple lines always um, mm. that were yeah. present in the diagrams. And yes. the purple line so somehow is uh, some imaginary surface that separates somehow the black hole and some region where we include gravity. 
and some region yeah. where here in the outside we think that gravity is very weak. Right. So, um, in, in cases where we have ADS, you would think of uh, the blue line as, let's say, the ADS boundary, and this yeah. other region, some other system external to ADS that we couple to the system. So that's the system that is really well defined that we can analyze uh, completely. Yes. Uh, for the purposes of doing this calculation, the calculation can be done with this purple surfaces, um, hmm. uh, but we don't know whether that there is a full gravity solution, the description that, uh, a microscopic description that would be consistent with the split of the space time. Mm -hmm. So in principle, there might be some uh, way to do it uh, formally if we put the purple surface infinitely far away and then we, uh, we divide the regions uh, perhaps uh, infinitely far away uh, in mm -hmm. flat space. So I think a little more work would be to define this very rigorously in flat space. I think mm -hmm. if you want to define it rigorously with the techniques we have today, we probably have to go to infinity so that we can neglect the quantum fluctuations of the surface. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, in that sense, uh, I think there should be some description in flat space. Um, I try to avoid including putting in ADS from the very beginning, just because mm -hmm. uh, I think these formulas are more general and can be applied to, to other situations also. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Some more questions, please. I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, uh, I would like to ask about the uh, version of this uh, uh, page curve problem for the eternal black hole. So first of all, a uh, more technical question. Uh, is it correct that uh, uh, in, in, every, in every case uh, for the eternal black hole, uh, you on, can only have quantum extremal surfaces for the black hole which are outside of the horizon, right? Yeah, that's when the black hole was in thermal equilibrium, yes. Okay, and the second question is, uh, is there any meaningful way in which the state dependence manifests itself in the uh, uh, eternal black hole version of the problem, or uh, is it non-existent there? Um, yeah, so th there is a lot of discussion in the literature of uh, state dependence, and people mean different things uh, when they talk about uh, state dependence. Um, I, I think, um, Yeah, so um, in some sense, uh, yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, for me, the, the perhaps clearest explanation would be a situation where we have, imagine we have something like the thermal field double, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can, we can do ADS now. Um, and, um, and here on the left, we just have one particular microstate here on the left, right? Um, and in some cases, like the SYK model, we can say we project on a particular, uh, some particular state, maybe not uh, time independent, but some, not an energy eigenstate, just some particular state. And in those cases, we think that the picture will be that there is here an end of the world brain on the left side, okay? And the right side, we have the ADS boundary. And the idea is that if we knew which particular microstate we have here, uh, then we can reconstruct uh, the interior. So if we had another, let's say, probe qubit here, uh, we would, by doing measurements purely here, we would be able to figure out what this is, okay? If we knew what, uh, what we have here. Now, if we don't know what we have here and we sum over all possible states or we, we just completely ignore this side, then you cannot reconstruct this. So in this sense, it state depends. You need some information about the state. Now, in many cases, you don't need all information. Of course, if you, if, you, if you need to know what this is and also what this one is, then okay, that, that's like some extreme state dependence. But the state dependence we have is that if you know, let's say some, at least some subspace of states that we have here on the left, uh, some big, could be very big subspace, maybe uh, a fraction of the total entropy, right? Uh, then you can reconstruct uh, the state of a small number of, relatively smaller number of qubits here. Um, but so it's that dependence in the sense that it depends on the density matrix row of uh, the right side here. Okay. Okay, thanks. More questions, please.
I, I should I should emphasize that this this is a milder state dependence than the one, for example, in Papadodimas and Regu. They had they had a stronger. Uh, it would be nice to understand better the relationship. Uh, So I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I want. Uh, I, I was wondering whether you can comment a bit on the relationship between the Euclidean replica trick calculations and the Lorentzian picture. Yeah. Um, well, the. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, well, the, the, the Euclidean, so the Euclidean replica, the, this replica trick works uh, in a nicer way in Euclidean space, okay? Now, usually you can put, the, you, it's useful to put some Euclidean evolution to prepare the state, at least mathematically to think about preparing some set states, we, it's useful to think about Euclidean evolution. And you can, um, you can consider a system that you evolve in Euclidean time, and then you evolve further in Lorentzian time, and then compute the entropy at some late uh, Lorentzian time. And in those cases, you can still use uh, this you partially Euclidean methods or a Euclidean, uh, some complex solutions that will have partly Lorentzian, partly Euclidean uh, regions, um, or partly close to Euclidean, close to Lorentzian. And in those cases, you can, um, you can do the computation using the replica trick. Um, and in principle, it's I, I suspect the replica trick is, is well defined for any any state that is reasonably well defined. I mean that it's uh, that you can describe using the semi-classical geometry. I'm not sure if this, is, this if I'm answering your question, right? but I can interpret your question as asking whether you can. Um, I, I interpreted your question as asking whether you can apply the replica trick uh, in a Lorentzian geometry. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, and yes, 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 yes. Typically, yes. Euclidean but, continuations do not contain the interior of the horizon. So that's why I was asking. Um, um, yes, yes, but, um, But I, I think maybe well, what you're saying is that you prepare the state by an Euclidean evolution, as you very often do. Well, let, 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 let me just give you one example. So, okay. uh, so there's this example that uh, we had uh, looked at with Ahmed and Raghu Mahajan, uh, which consisted on, of uh, an ADS. Uh, so ADS is this region. Uh, this region here is ADS. And then some flat space regions outside, right? Uh -huh. So that was the Lorentzian geometry, and you can consider it as being prepared by Euclidean evolution, which is Euclidean evolution on um, something we can draw this way. So, so there is um, there is flat space outside, okay? So this is flat, um, and then the the circle here is just the Euclidean version of the of the space here. This surface here at this uh, position corresponds to this surface here at equal to zero. And uh, so in this case, uh, we can compute the, um, the entropy, for example, of a region that, uh, for example, starts here and includes the whole black hole, the whole right side. And this will involve a quantum extremal surface, which is somewhere here, right? So it includes, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, this is a spatial slice of the entanglement wedge. Um, and it can also be found, so there will be a surface here also in this Euclidean geometry. And in, in this case, you can find some uh, somewhat concrete Euclidean geometries if there is a lot of matter that look uh, roughly like this. Uh, so this is the Euclidean geometry with two replicas and uh, the solution that gives the Hawking result. On the right side, we have the one that gives the, uh, the page answer at late times. Now, in some cases, this geometry might not exist at, uh, at early times so it might be so here when we do this computation uh, you can do it at various times so especially when you consider both sides um, so um, you you can consider an interval like this at, uh, at sorry I didn't draw the intervals properly so some interval roughly like this um, 
And um, in this case, at late times, there will be a solution, but it's a solution that will be a mixture of uh, Lorentzian and Euclidean evolution. And it's complex and hasn't been found explicitly. I see. <laughs> but the idea is that it is the analytic continuation of a uh, Euclidean-like solution that as, as I was discussing before. Um, yeah, the, the picture that, that uh, I showed you before. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay. I think the time is over. So, Juan, thank you very much once again for your great talk. So, thank you, everybody. And maybe we have before the net a talk, just two minutes break. Okay? Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.